Hi everyone, I'm doing a social experiment for my vlog about identity and as part of this I recently asked you what kind of person you thought I was. I don't recommend everyone doing this and I thought about it a lot. After all, there are a lot of trolls out there, but I got tons of lovely replies. I can't thank you enough for all your nice comments. I'm kind of surprised that most of you know me so well. If you're curious what others said, keep on watching this video. Here's the first reply. This comment is spot on. I do have a positive attitude to life. I am rather cheerful. I don't tend to complain a lot. I always try to look on the bright side. Here's comment number two. This one is only partly true. I am fairly ambitious and I set myself goals all the time. The problems start when I have to work on them. Not that I'm lazy or anything, but I'm not as hardworking as I wish I was. You're in for a surprise. I'm not very sociable and I don't make friends easily. I was really shy when I was in primary school. I lacked confidence and was often awkward in social situations. Now it's a bit better, thanks to this vlog. My friends keep telling me that I've recently become quite talkative. I actually think they're right. I'm not so sure. I think I get upset easily. My cousin George is definitely much more easygoing than I am. I don't cope with stress too well and I probably worry too much. Oh, thank you for this comment. It's so kind, you've made my day. Uh, I don't know about modest. Like most vloggers, I spend a lot of time talking about myself. Although, I try to be generous, getting involved in fundraising campaigns and things like that. I don't understand vloggers that won't do that kind of thing. It's so selfish. Okay, that's it for this video. But before I go, I just want to say thank you. As I said at the beginning, I was a bit worried about nasty comments, but your messages have all been really kind and really thoughtful. I'm going to put all my results from my social experiment in another video. But for now, it's goodbye. You guys are awesome. See you next time. Hi, it's Andy. Please leave a message. Hi Andy, it's Lewis. Colin and I are planning to go to this workshop about building confidence tomorrow. I've read some really good reviews. People who took part in the workshop could go to a job interview and stay calm. Do you want to come too? If so, you must register today. I'll send you the link to their website. Talk to you later. Speaker 1 I've heard other people make fun of the personality tests you can find online, such as Which character of your favourite TV show are you? Or Are you a lion or a sheep? But these aren't really personality tests. They're just entertainment and have nothing to do with psychology. The real personality tests are supposed to help you discover who you are or help you make the most important decisions in your life, like choosing a career path. I once had a test like this at school. There were only yes-no options, quite easy to answer. For example, 
When I go shopping, I need a lot of time to decide what to buy. A few weeks later, we got our results. Some of the comments there surprised me. Since then, I know what I'm really good at and I know what I should work on. Speaker 2 Can you believe that there are only 16 types of people in the world? For me, this doesn't make much sense. But Catherine Cook Briggs and her daughter Isabel Briggs Myers created a personality test known as the Myers Briggs Type Indicator, which divides people into 16 personality types. Surprisingly, it's the most popular personality test in the world. About 4 million people in 26 countries take it every year, mainly employees, students or soldiers. The test consists of 93 questions, where you have to choose one of the two possible answers. I once took this test and wasn't able to choose either of the two answers given. My answer was somewhere in between. Uh, just to give you an idea, in one question I had to decide if I preferred to spend time alone or with other people. Well, that all depends. On some days I'm very sociable, and on others I need some me time. Speaker 3 I'm a psychologist, and I often use the Rorschach ink blot test at work. What does it look like? Rorschach images are ink blots of irregular shapes. I show people ten pictures, and they can hold them in any position and say whatever they want about them. What does it tell me? Lots of surprisingly different things. For example, when one picture presents something looking like two people. If a person analyses this picture fast, he or she is probably very confident. But when someone takes their time, they might lack confidence in social situations. Speaker 4 I used to believe in personality tests. I spent over £300 to check my personality because I thought it would help me develop. Each time I took the test, I discovered something new about myself. All of the test results I got seemed to apply to me, but sometimes they didn't agree with one another. For instance, one test showed that I was hard-working and ambitious, and the other that I was lazy. When I realised that, I found out about the Fora effect and stopped taking these tests. If you've never heard about the Fora effect, it's a psychological phenomenon according to which people believe that the personality description accurately analyses their character even though it's general and can in fact refer to anyone. Speaker 5 I work as a headhunter, so it's my job to find people with the right skills and the right personality for companies who look for employees. A personality test is one of the tools I use but I'm aware of its limits. The result of the test may depend on many different things, like the mood of the person on the day they're taking it, what has recently happened in their lives, or how focused they are. I usually warn those who take the tests that they need to concentrate and not get distracted. You'll never believe what happened to me last week. I got a reply from the art college. I sent them my portfolio with some of my paintings ages ago and they finally got back to me. One of their art teachers, Mr Nick Brown, sent me an email. He wrote that they loved my works. Mr Brown said I was very creative.
Wow, that's such great news. You should be proud of yourself. Speaking of art, do you remember that Mrs. Williams is taking our class to the Museum of Modern Art next Tuesday? She reminded us to bring sketchbooks and pencils. Thanks. I completely forgot about it. Anyway, as I was saying, the art college offered to help me financially if I decided to study at their school. They said I wouldn't have to pay for the classes, only for the accommodation. This is a dream come true. But, unfortunately, my parents don't see it this way. What are you talking about? Well, you know what they're like. They generally don't approve of my life choices. Yesterday, my mum told me she had always hoped I would follow in my dad's footsteps and become a doctor. She warned me against being an artist. My parents are exactly the same. They have completely different values than I do, but they still expect me to make the same life choices as they did 20 or 30 years ago. For example, my dad ordered me not to spend so much time online, and he told me this when I was doing maths homework, the one we have to do online. Tell me about it. Oh, before I forget, can you text me the numbers of these maths exercises we have to do? Sure. You know, I asked you twice if you had written them down and each time you insisted that I shouldn't worry about it. In any case, what are you going to do with the art college and your parents? I don't know. I have absolutely no idea. Why don't you start by talking to our school psychologist? She also gives career advice, so maybe she'll be able to help you. And now for our regular focus on health and fitness. As usual, we'll be talking to our expert, Irina, but we'd also like to hear from you about your experiences of owning or working with animals and, in particular, of any health benefits you found. Phone or email us with your stories, please. Now, Irina, I think you're going to start by explaining why relationships with animals can be good for us. Yes. So, I think we're all aware that keeping a pet can have really positive effects, both physically and mentally. For example, Walking a dog makes us exercise regularly, and that's good for controlling our weight and keeping our hearts healthy. And just being outside is great for reducing stress and anxiety, and it helps to relieve depression. It's also a way of meeting other people and developing social relationships. Dog owners are always stopping to chat to each other, and there are plenty of clubs and activities for pet owners, and not just dogs, of course. And animals can be particularly good for children and for older people? That's right. Children learn a sense of responsibility from looking after animals, having to feed them and exercise them and so on. It also improves their social and emotional skills, so they have better relationships with people. And of course, many older people suffer from loneliness, so a pet can be a really important companion later in life. In fact, studies have shown that older people who own a pet tend to have fewer medical issues than people without one. Now, I know you also wanted to talk about another animal. Yes. Now, I'm not suggesting that listeners should go out and buy one of these as a pet, but we don't often discuss the relationship between humans and horses. This is quite different to owning a cat or dog, partly because of their size, but also because we don't really think of them as pets. We still consider them as quite wild in a way. But there are many benefits to owning or working with horses. 
Looking after them requires a lot of hard work physically, and of course, you have to be fairly fit and strong to ride a horse. You also have to trust it, and that's all good for building confidence. Fascinating. So, Irina, are there any other animals? Hey guys, it's me, George, and welcome to the vlog. And me, Alicia. Sorry, guys. I just bought these chocolates. Oh, cheers, mate. Hey, hands off. Do you know how much I paid for these? Six pounds fifty. They were only four pounds seventy-five last time I bought them. What a rip-off! Do you think so? Well, how else do you explain it? You don't do economics, do you? Let me give you a quick lesson. As you probably know, the main ingredient in chocolate is cocoa, and around seventy percent of it is grown in West Africa. It's then exported and traded all around the world and turned into the chocolate we all know and love. But now imagine there's really bad weather, and the cocoa doesn't grow well. The supply of cocoa begins to fall, but over in the UK, consumer demand is still high. So people still want their chocolates, don't they? For sure. So the price of your chocolate goes up. Now, let's look at distribution. Okay. Cocoa beans like these. Are transported by ships, and what powers ships? Oil. So if the price of oil suddenly increases, the cost of importing cocoa will go up. And what happens then? The price will go up too. Exactly. Then there's the production of chocolate here in the UK. What's going to happen to the price if factories have to increase the pay of their workers? On the production line, it'll go up. Exactly, and let's remember about the changing value of currency, like U.S. dollars, or the U.K. pounds, or euros. Do we have to? I think I get the picture. Now, have a chocolate. Thank you. You see. Chocolate is traded in U.S. dollars. Bye, guys. Oh, sorry. See you guys next time. So, if the value of your local currency goes down, guess what happens to the price of chocolates? So you're here to talk about your repair shop. It's a very good idea. Thanks, Mrs. Baxter. First of all, let's talk about opening times. You can open at break times, but the rule is you close the shop five minutes before the start of lessons. Is that clear? You can also open at lunch times, but it isn't necessary. That's your decision. Yes, of course. Is it necessary for me to tell you the days we want to open? No. That isn't important, but I don't think it's a good idea to open every day. The business can't have a negative effect on your schoolwork. That's fine. I know I won't be able to go to university if I don't pass my exams. Good. Now let's talk about money. There is a school council rule that twenty percent of profits go to the school charity. I understand. Thanks a lot, Mrs. Baxter. I really appreciate this opportunity. You're welcome, and good luck. These days, thanks to the internet, goods can be traded and ideas shared around the world at the touch of a screen. Raising our knowledge and understanding of the world, we may think that this is a very modern development, 
but you can find its roots over 2,000 years ago in the Silk Roads, an 8,000 kilometer network of paths and roads that connected Europe, the Middle East, Central and East Asia together. The Scythians, a nomadic people from Central Asia, were among the first to actively trade with the Chinese, Persians, Greeks and Romans. For the first time, important trading and cultural connections were created between civilizations that had never met. Initially, these connected China with Central Asia and then the Mediterranean with Persia and India. In around 200 BCE, the Chinese Emperor Han sent traders west with Chinese silk, cotton and other goods. They established new routes that connected China with Europe. The Silk Road was born. The Europeans fell in love with Chinese silk and pottery, things like pots and vases, and imported huge amounts of it while the Chinese developed a taste for glass exported from Rome and many European fruits and vegetables, such as grapes, peppers and walnuts. But more important than the trade in goods, it was the sharing and exchange of ideas, such as culture, religion and technology along the Silk Road, that would change the world and bring comparisons with the internet. Europeans imported papermaking and printing techniques from the Chinese, which meant books could be printed quickly and cheaply. This contributed to a huge growth in education, communication and science. The magnetic compass, too, which was invented in China, travelled across the world on the Silk Road. This tool for navigation, the GPS of its day, arrived in Europe around the 12th century and helped sailors find their way across oceans. The consequences of this new technology were massive. With their taste for exotic goods, Europeans began to set off on voyages across the Atlantic Ocean in search of new routes to Asia. On their way, they expanded into Africa and arrived in North and South America. For the first time, the entire world was connected. Goods, information, ideas and technology could be shared and people around the world could learn from each other. The modern age, the age of information, had begun. These days, Thanks to the internet, goods can be traded and ideas shared around the world at the touch of a screen, raising our knowledge and understanding of the world. We may think that this is a very modern development, but you can find its roots over 2,000 years ago in the Silk Roads, an 8,000 kilometre network of paths and roads that connected Europe, the Middle East, Central and East Asia together. The Scythians, a nomadic people from Central Asia, were among the first to actively trade with the Chinese, Persians, Greeks and Romans. For the first time, important trading and cultural connections were created between civilizations that had never met. Initially, these connected China with Central Asia and then the Mediterranean with Persia and India. In around 200 BCE, the Chinese Emperor Han sent traders west with Chinese silk, cotton and other goods. They established new routes that connected China with Europe. The Silk Road was born. The Europeans fell in love with Chinese silk and pottery, things like pots and vases, and imported huge amounts of it, while the Chinese developed a taste for glass exported from Rome and many European fruits and vegetables, such as grapes, peppers and walnuts. 
But more important than the trade in goods, it was the sharing and exchange of ideas, such as culture, religion and technology along the Silk Road, that would change the world and bring comparisons with the internet. Europeans imported papermaking and printing techniques from the Chinese, which meant books could be printed quickly and cheaply. This contributed to a huge growth in education, communication and science. The magnetic compass, too, which was invented in China, travelled across the world on the Silk Road. This tool for navigation, the GPS of its day, arrived in Europe around the 12th century and helped sailors find their way across oceans. The consequences of this new technology were massive. With their taste for exotic goods, Europeans began to set off on voyages across the Atlantic Ocean in search of new routes to Asia. On their way, they expanded into Africa and arrived in North and South America. For the first time, the entire world was connected. Goods, information, ideas and technology could be shared and people around the world could learn from each other. The modern age, the age of information, had begun. Here's another mysterious case that was never solved. There was this guy called D.B. Cooper and in November 1971, he was on a flight from Portland to Seattle in the USA when he told the flight attendant he had a bomb. He then demanded $200,000 and four parachutes when the plane landed at Seattle. Four parachutes? What for? Good question. There was definitely no one else involved. That's strange. Yeah. Then, with the money and the parachutes, he told the pilot to fly southeast towards Mexico. On the way, Cooper moved to the back of the plane where no one could see him. All the pilot knew was that the door was opened and Cooper and the money were gone, but they didn't know where. So, it's pretty certain that he jumped out of the plane. I agree. I'm sure he didn't stay on the plane. They searched it later on at the airport and couldn't find him. But the weird thing was, they never found him, his body or any of the money. Perhaps someone was waiting for him on the ground and drove him across the border. Maybe. Or I think it's possible that the pilot knew about the plan and helped him escape. Oh, do you think so? That's interesting. But in 1980, a boy found a small amount of the money by the side of the Colorado River. But no one ever found Cooper. So, on this evening's Spare a Thought, I'm talking to journalist and activist Katie Martin about how we can be better global citizens when we go shopping. Katie, what do you think? I think that as consumers, we need to understand the power we have to choose how we spend our money. And these days, there is so much more information available, making it so much easier to be a good consumer. Yeah, but it can also be really expensive too. I'm not sure it has to be expensive. In fact, I think it's about making better choices. Let's look at the clothes we buy. Did you know that the fashion industry is the second largest polluter after the oil industry. And that's because of fast fashion. How can that be? Well, what are most of the T-shirts, jeans and tops you buy made from? Uh, cotton. Hmm. To grow the cotton, you need huge amounts of water, chemicals and pesticides. 
And the factories that make the clothes also use loads of different chemicals and colours, which just get washed away into rivers. And then there's all the transport costs to export the clothes from the countries where they are made all around the world. I've never really thought about that. Mm, but the worst thing is because these clothes are so cheap, people buy them, wear them a few times, and then just throw them away, which creates more pollution. I see your point. I've done this in the past without really thinking about it. I think we all have. It's just so easy, isn't it? But it's also really easy to change. First of all, when you go shopping, avoid those shops that sell the really cheap clothes. You'll save a lot of money and will buy less on impulse. And when you do shop, choose clothes that are good quality and that you can wear on lots of different occasions. Good idea. Then, try and buy more second-hand clothes. They aren't expensive, you can find some really cool stuff, and whatever you buy is not going to end up as more waste. Or better still, arrange clothing swaps with friends. Yeah, there are some amazing vintage stores around here. Exactly. And finally, buy the clothes you love, and love the clothes you buy. If you aren't sure about something, don't buy it because it's cheap. And when you have bought something you love, look after it so it lasts longer. That's great advice. Thanks a lot. I'm keen to start saving some money and wanted to ask you a few questions. Of course, I'd be happy to help. What's the best thing to do to save money in general? In the past, I found it really difficult. Good question. I think the most important thing to do is to get into the habit of doing it. Let me ask you a question. Do you brush your teeth every day? Of course. I do it twice a day. Exactly. It's a habit and you do it without thinking. If you can start saving now, it'll become as normal as brushing your teeth. So, first of all, when you get your money, whether it's pocket money or your wages from a part-time job, you need to take out the amount you want to save straight away. That makes a lot of sense. But my problem is I usually spend everything I get. How can I change that? Have you thought about making a note of everything you buy in a week and then asking yourself which things you need to buy and which you don't. You'll soon find ways to save. That's a good idea. I seem to spend a fortune on credit for my phone. What would you advise me to do about that? If I were you, I'd turn it off. But if you can't do that, try and limit your use to places where there is free Wi-Fi. OK, I'll try. Next, how do you think I should manage my savings at the moment? If you're saving in a bank, I think it would be a good idea for you or your mum or dad to open a separate savings account. These accounts usually offer higher rates of interest for young savers and some don't allow you to withdraw any money for a period of time. They really are the best way to save. What about saving at home? Your best option is to get a box that you can lock and keep it in a separate place to the rest of your money and put money in it when you can. It's also a good idea to give the key to your mum or dad. That's a great idea. Thanks for the advice. Hello guys and welcome back to the channel. It's just me today because I want to talk to you about houses. Let me guess. Boring, right? That's because what I really want to talk to you about is house swapping. 
and that's way more interesting. So let's get on with it. I'm studying at the University of Manchester. My brother works here too, and we live together in his house, which looks like this. Ta-da! Okay, correction. He only owns the downstairs flat of the house. Fat chance he'd be able to afford the whole place. It's tiny. I mean, cozy. None of the furniture matches the style of anything else in the house. In fact, a lot of it comes from our parents' attic because he couldn't afford new stuff. The flat isn't exactly stylish. We never found the time to decorate, but it's in a great location and we love it. And it turns out other people do too. You see, Manchester's got a famous university, two famous football clubs, and a lot of shops. So it's super popular with tourists. And when they come here, they stay in our flat, thanks to this really cool house swapping website. The idea is simple. Tourists to your city can stay at your place and you can stay at theirs. It's perfect for holidays. And best of all, it's free. Right now, I'm looking for a cheap holiday by the beach. This guy John has a place in Split in Croatia. And it's perfect. The apartment block is near the city centre. It looks old, but the flat looks comfortable. Okay. It isn't exactly spacious, but it's got a sofa, a small kind of armchair, and a TV. What more would we want? The kitchen is a bit old fashioned, but it's got all the appliances we need, like a fridge, a freezer, an oven, and a kettle. I'm not sure about the color of the cupboards, but, I like those curtains that go right to the ceiling. Okay. Not much room for a built-in wardrobe here. The bed takes up most of the space, but it looks clean and comfortable. There is another bedroom, but it's only got this picture. That can be my brother's room. Okay, so it's small, but then again, so is our apartment. The listing says there's more room for storing stuff in the basement of the building. We'll also be on holiday, so we're not going to be spending much time there anyway. My main concern is, does the flat get very hot in summer? I checked online and Croatia is boiling during the summer. No worries. There's air conditioning. Fantastic. So looks like we're going to Croatia. Now, I just need to show my brother his room. <laughs> See you guys next time. Hi, Julie. Where were you yesterday? I called you a few times. Oh. I had lunch with my brother. The one who studies IT? No, with Joe. You know Joe, don't you? He works in the cafe. I can't find my headphones. Have you seen them anywhere? Which ones? I only have one pair of headphones. They're white and wireless. Oh, yeah. I saw them under the sofa. I thought they were monikers. Sylvie, do you remember Mrs Shaw? Yes, of course. Her daughter played the guitar in the school band. Well, Mrs Shaw invited us all for dinner next Saturday. I love your curtains, Emma. Where did you get them? I don't know. 
My mum ordered them online a few months ago. What are these, Mike? These are the tickets to the art exhibition. We were talking about this exhibition last week. In my presentation today about future developments and inventions, I'd like to show you the house where, I suppose, a lot of us will be living in 50 years or so. I believe that its simple design and unique features are exactly what we'll be looking for in houses in the future. This is a Diogene house which was designed by a famous Italian architect, Renzo Piano. Perhaps his name doesn't sound familiar to you, but I'm sure you've seen or heard about some buildings which Renzo Piano designed. For example, the Shard in London, which is currently the tallest building in the UK and also one of the tallest in Europe. Throughout his life, Renzo Piano has dreamed of creating a tiny but functional house. In 2009, he published the idea and not long after that, the first model of the house was built. Piano decided to call it Diogene after a Greek philosopher, Diogenes, who gave up luxuries and decided to spend his life living in a barrel. What makes the Diogene house so special? Well, it's really tiny, but it's also self-sufficient and uses modern, sustainable technologies. Diogene is only 7.5 metres squared and according to Piano, it's ideal for one person. When you look at these pictures, you can see that it was carefully planned and there's everything you might need. It has a living area with a table, a chair and a sofa bed. There's also a bathroom with a toilet and a shower and a small kitchen with a built-in sink and a fridge. One of the biggest advantages of this house is the fact that the furniture doesn't take up too much space and is very easy to use. Besides, there's a lot of space for storing items. In the walls, there are also built-in shelves and you can also keep things in the attic. Looking at this design, I suppose it must be a very comfortable place to live in. I also like how eco-friendly the Diogene house is. There are solar panels on the roof which heat the water and provide electricity for lighting as well as the stove and the fridge. The rainwater is collected on the roof and then stored in a special container underneath the house. Later, this water is filtered and can be used for washing and cooking. The special wooden panels on the walls keep the house warm and cosy in winter and cool in summer. However, there's no air conditioning and I'm a bit worried that during very hot summers or heat waves, it might get too hot or it might be difficult to breathe inside. Another thing that is worth mentioning about Diogene is that it can be moved to different locations. Imagine you live in a Diogene home and for some reason you need to move to another part of the country. It isn't a problem. You can take your whole house with you. Renzo Piano thought about it too. The house is light and can be easily transported by a helicopter or a truck. Maybe it'd be better if the owner could attach the wheels to the bottom of the house and move it like a typical caravan instead of arranging and paying for a truck or a helicopter. Still, it's amazing that the house can be moved so easily and if they decide to get rid of it, it can be put into pieces and then recycled. Finally, I'd like to... 
Speaker 1. What was I the saddest about when I had to move out of town? Friends, obviously, but also all these places I've known since I was a little child. My favourite cafe, where they sold the best ice cream. A bookshop I often went to. A park where I rode my bike. So, after I had moved to a new city, I looked for similar places there. I wrote down their addresses, and then every day after school I went to explore. I found a nice cafe and a great shop with arts and crafts materials. It helped me feel at home in this new place. Speaker 2 When I moved to a new house, I was really excited at first. It was only a 20-minute drive away from our old flat. I could still go to the same school and I had such a cool new room. But then I realised that I can't just go out of the house and play football with the same friends I've been hanging out with all my life. They live too far away now. To stop feeling so down, I called my best friend and we played online games together and had a great laugh. It was fun too. Speaker 3 I was 11 when I moved from Slovakia to the USA. This was such a drastic change. New country, new language, new school. I didn't speak English very well, and I was really nervous that I wouldn't know what teachers or classmates would want from me. But then I thought, what am I scared of the most? That I won't understand anyone? Maybe they'll help me and speak more slowly. Obviously, I didn't understand much on my first day, but... I wasn't that terrified anymore. Speaker 4 When my dad was transferred from his job in Toronto to Brazil, I felt terrible. I didn't speak Portuguese and I didn't want to give up my ice hockey team. But then I spoke to my coach and he told me to use this time in Brazil to explore new hobbies and sports. Although I went to an American school there, I signed up for Portuguese classes. I also took up surfing. When we came back to Toronto two years later, all my friends wanted me to teach them to surf. Speaker 5 